Summer 2010, an SOS goes out. There's been an accident on Monte Rosa, one of the highest peaks in Europe. Three climbers are stranded at over 4,500 meters. Up here, the air is dangerously thin, and not just for the climbers. This is right on the limit of where most helicopters can fly, but not this one. All three climbers are rescued in a single operation, and a helicopter that is rewriting the rule book has proved its worth in dramatic style. This is the new hero of the helicopter world, an aircraft designed to be without limits. A go-anywhere monster machine that can fly higher and further through storms, blizzards, and intense heat to do the tough, muscular jobs that others can't. This is the Augusta Westland AW139, a super chopper born of brave decisions, ingenious solutions, and the determination to succeed. And built outside Milan in a helicopter mega factory. Helicopters are flying machines that almost defy physics. In many ways, they're more limited than fixed-wing aircraft and much harder to design and build. But they have some huge advantages. They can take off and land almost anywhere, and they can hover, which makes them very useful for all sorts of very tough jobs. So for aircraft manufacturers, if you can overcome the design and engineering challenges, there's a huge market for these multi-million euro machines. One such manufacturer, Italy's Augusta, thrived in the helicopter business when it branched out from aeroplane manufacture in 1952. First building Bell helicopters under license, the company quickly developed its own models. Until an event hundreds of kilometers north in Germany signaled a devastating reversal of fortune. The collapse of the Berlin Wall triggered the end of the Cold War. Great news for the people of Europe, less so for helicopter manufacturers. For decades, their order books had been filled by military contracts. But on the 9th of November 1989, the orders started drying up. The Berlin Wall crumbled. And with it, the entire defense industry suffered uh, shockwaves in the early 90s because of the complete changing scenario. So uh, for Augusta, it was equally difficult to, to live in those years. Augusta needed a new strategy and a vive. And they saw a gap in the market that might just save the company. The gap was for a medium-sized helicopter with twin engines a class that was dominated by 20-year-old designs. A brand new medium twin, built with all the latest materials and technology, might be able to outperform and outsell all the competition. So Augusta set out to design and build a powerful modern machine that could be adapted to do any job anywhere. But it was a massive gamble. The investment that you put in a helicopter today is hundreds of millions of euros. You must make it right. If you don't make it right, you risk the very existence of the company. But if you make it very right, you actually propel the company into a new dimension. Now merged as Augusta Westland, the mega factory is based on the outskirts of Milan, with a fabrication plant in Cascina Costa. And 23 kilometers away, in Vergate, the helicopters are built and tested. It's here in Vichyate that the company must tackle the most fundamental problem of building the 139. To recover their investment, they must sell it to a very wide range of customers. But how can they make one helicopter that's perfect for so many different jobs? From mountain rescue to luxury VIP. The answer is, they don't. 
On these main assembly lines, the workers can build not one, but over 150 different helicopters, tailor-made variants of the Core 139 design. And Tommaso Coli is one of Augusta's young tailors. His job is to measure up the client's needs and to make sure they get a helicopter that's exactly right for the job. In this line, we assemble all the different versions of 139. So offshore, search and rescue, air ambulance, VIP, utility. This is going to be a naval search and rescue craft. So we need to make sure it gets a winch, an infrared camera, and extra protection from the elements. The logistics of this tailor-made approach are daunting. With as many as 14 different versions being assembled simultaneously, how can you be sure that you're putting the right components on the right aircraft? The designers of the factory need a foolproof system. So each helicopter variant has its own set of blueprints and a unique code. The workers at each station can tap in the code for an on-screen guide to building that individual machine, one step at a time. To maximize output, the mega factory has two main assembly lines that run in parallel, each with seven man stations where different components are added. Every station has a nine-day build cycle, so it takes about two months to assemble each helicopter. The assembly begins at station zero. Custom-built fuselage shells are fitted to bases that hold them upright until their wheels are added at a much later stage. With any helicopter, keeping weight to a minimum is key to performance. So the 139 shell uses a titanium and aluminium frame and composite panels. The internal wall structure is like a honeycomb, giving the strength of a solid wall with far less weight. The shell has huge door spaces and the biggest possible interior for a helicopter of this class. And the clever bit of the design is keeping this empty. So those 150 variants can pack in anything from 15 passengers to a wide variety of kit and equipment. The designers keep the floor low and flat by shifting the fuel cells from their traditional position underneath to behind the cabin. They also mount the gearbox on top of the cabin rather than inside, freeing huge amounts of space. The result is a smooth, empty box almost unheard of in this class of helicopter, and absolutely perfect for jobs like this. Mountain Rescue. Roberto Zanotto is a mountain rescue pilot in the Italian Alps, and his 139 is packed full of the latest rescue kit. The cabin is very big. We've got one stretcher here, but there's room for two. And there's medical equipment in the corner to monitor the patient. The other unique characteristic of this machine is the skis that allow the helicopter to land on snow. And on top of all that, there's the winch, which is there to rescue climbers on rocky mountain faces. At the peak of the skiing season, Roberto's team are called out up to 12 times per day. We have to leave them now because there's an emergency. Helicopters are ideal for mountain rescue because of their ability to hover or even land almost anywhere. But they do have a serious drawback. The altitude limits on choppers are much lower than for aeroplanes because of the thin air. Here's a small demonstration to help you understand the problems that pilots have to overcome when they fly at high altitude. 
We just left base and we're going to put some air in this bag and see what happens as we go up. Senza comprimere troppo e vediamo cosa succede salendo in quota. 20 minutes later, and after a climb of 1300 meters, the bag looks different. L'aria che abbiamo messo nel sacchetto giù in basso si è espansa. The air we put in the plastic bag at the bottom of the lift has expanded. This is because at this altitude, the air is thinner. And we only went up a thousand meters. Imagine what would have happened if we had gone to 4,000 meters or more. The bag would have burst. The thin air makes it hard for a helicopter because there's less density for the blades to push against. And there's less oxygen for the engines to burn. So many helicopters struggle to reach high peaks, let alone have the capacity to pick up stranded climbers. But the AW139 is all about breaking these limits. And the solution is quite simple. The PT6 turbo shaft jet engine is the V8 of aviation. A tried and tested workhorse. It's an engine that can meet the diverse needs of the many different variants of this helicopter. On the 139, each engine is capable of producing 1,700 horsepower, more than double the power of a current Formula One car. That's a lot of brute force for carrying lots of passengers or equipment. And it produces a top speed of 309 kilometers an hour, which for those busy VIPs makes this the fastest chopper in its class. Most important of all, these brutish engines deliver the go-anywhere capability the project needs for success. They have the power and reliability for long-distance offshore work. They'll operate in the hot, thin air of the Middle Eastern deserts, and they break through the limits for mountain rescue. As rescue pilot Roberto Zanotto had a chance to find out for himself when he was called out to an emergency on Monte Rosa in the Alps at over four and a half thousand meters. On the edge of capability, the previous generation of rescue helicopters struggled to reach this height. It was time to see what the 139 could do. I remember that as we approached the target, I agreed with the winchman that we'd pick up the first climber and drop them off at a base camp at lower altitude before going back to pick up the next one. But the rescue doesn't quite go to plan. In fact, it goes much better. When we got there, the helicopter still had so much power. We were able to rescue all three at the same time, in complete safety. Back at the Vergiati assembly line, the second engine that provides all that power is going in. It's a painstaking process. The engine is first lowered into position above its titanium casing. Two workers guide dozens of delicate pipes into the correct positions. There are multiple fuel lines, drainage lines, and electrical connections. Each engine costs hundreds of thousands of dollars, and one slip could crush a vital component. It can take up to 10 hours to install each engine. The reason there are two is not just for more power, but for safety. Each has enough power so that if one fails, the helicopter can get home safely on the other. Very important because Augusta Westland is relying on attracting one type of user in particular for their new go-anywhere super chopper. And that's the oil and gas offshore industry. These guys need to reach platforms that can be hundreds of kilometers out to sea. So for them, safety is a big selling point. Having two engines is a no-brainer. 
but unfortunately, there can only be one of these, the transmission system or gearbox. So the design of this crucial component is going to be vital to the success of the entire project. The job of the transmission is to gear down the massive power of the twin engines from 21,000 RPM from the engine's output shafts to rotor speeds of 300 RPM for the main rotor and around 1,200 RPM for the tail rotor. The nightmare scenario for a transmission system is an oil leak. Without lubrication, the gears heat up and will eventually disintegrate. And when the transmission stops, so do the rotors. 23 kilometers south of the assembly line at the Kashina Costa facility, this safety critical component is built and designed in-house. To secure the confidence of the offshore industry, the design team must meet an extraordinary challenge. Led by chief designer Giuseppe Gasparini, they must build a transmission system that can run without any oil. In the past, high-speed helicopters could only run for a few minutes without oil. The regulations then changed at the request of the offshore oil and gas industries and the military. They wanted a longer running time, up to 30 minutes. Gasparini's mission is make up the entire 139 project. 30 minutes without oil, in a gearbox handling up to 3,500 horsepower with dozens of critical components. It's the challenge of a lifetime. The hardest part to run for 30 minutes without oil is where the engine connects to the transmission, where we have high speed and high power. But Gasparini has a trick up his sleeve. He can cheat the oil leak by slowing down the loss of oil from this critical area. The first thing to do to reach this target is to create reservoirs inside the high-speed stage so that we can lubricate the most critical zones for longer when there is loss of oil. The reservoirs buy Gasparini vital minutes, but reaching that target of 30 minutes is ultimately going to come down to the precision of its construction. Transmission costs half a million euros to build. But first, Augusta had to build a prototype that could pass the oil leak test. It had to be extremely strong, but also built to very precise tolerances. This is the domain of engineering manager Domenico D'Agostino, who keeps an eagle eye on every stage of production. Lo smusso qui effettivamente richiede un'operazione tale da dover essere ripassato, ripassato totalmente, ok? Grazie. We make all of the critical components here from scratch so that we can control their quality. You can see here we've already made the first rough cut on this steel bar to make a basic shape. And now we're going to cut it again to make it look like this. The cutting machine has a circle of spinning teeth controlled by a computer. The technician needs to make sure the steel bar is mounted dead center. When the needle on this instrument stops moving, he knows he's got it right. From here, the computer ensures accurate cutting to tolerances of thousandths of a millimeter. The oil spray stops the part and the tools from overheating, which would make the cutting inaccurate. Even so, there's still room for error and a single inaccurate part could destroy the transmission when it attempts its dry oil leak run. This is our test area. This is for the finished components. We don't simply check a proportion of the parts. We check all the parts. And we check every geometrical characteristic of every single part. This room is sealed off from the rest of the factory to maintain a constant humidity of 50% and a temperature of exactly 20 degrees Celsius. 
just a degree hotter could expand the metal parts and make the measurements inaccurate. Every part must meet its strict tolerances. I'm not the best person to talk about hair, but we're talking about a thickness considerably less than that of a human hair. The surface of every tooth on every gear is checked. If the test finds a flaw, the part is rejected. And a correction signal is sent to the actual machine that cut it, so that the mistake doesn't happen again. And this device is used to find microscopic cracks in the surface of the metal. But some parts are too complex to be measured by machines and must be measured by humans. But no ordinary humans. To work in this area, you need at least 20 years' experience. And the apprentices aren't spring chickens either. We have to support the new generation. In this case, a youngster is taught by an old hand. It's not everyone's calling in life to work here. And only one in five apprentices lasts the course to this most hallowed of positions. After all this precision, the next stage seems extraordinary. Many of these precisely cut and measured components are now baptized with fire. In these furnaces, some components are baked for as long as a week, at temperatures up to 575 degrees Celsius. Vital to the mission of building an almost indestructible gearbox, this process chemically hardens the components. Once cooked, they're quenched in oil. Then moved to a freezer set to minus 95 degrees to complete the process. Hardly surprisingly, after such an ordeal, the parts must be measured again before they finally make it to the robotically operated component store to wait for installation. Assembly is slow and meticulous, taking up to 120 hours. Once all the finished parts have been checked, we proceed with the assembly operation, which is very strictly controlled. There's one operator and one supervisor who complete the job together until we get to this configuration. At this point, the transmission is ready to be tested. After almost a year of fabrication, this transmission is ready to be tested. Before its crucial dry test, the original prototype ran countless of these fully lubricated flight simulations. Finally, the time came for the big challenge, the 30-minute dry run. An oil leak was artificially created, and the run began. This was make or break for the transmission system. The whole AW139 project. And for designer Giuseppe Gasparini. The oil test is psychologically very stressful because it's a test that's short, but it feels incredibly long. It lasts for 30 minutes, and until it's over, you can't be sure that you've succeeded. Even then, to be sure they'd succeeded, the gearbox had to be completely disassembled and every component checked for damage. The transmission had more than just survived its 30 minutes. No damage at all was found. An amazing result for Gasparini and his team. The final stage was basically very intense and exhausting. It involved lots of people, but in the end, it was a great relief. Hundreds of Coast Guard rescue stations around the world rely on helicopters to save lives. The crews based at this station, at Salzana on the northwest coast of Italy, fly hundreds of hours every year. Sea rescue is almost always a race against time, and they're often asked to fly in appalling conditions. 
So this is a key test for the 139 and its advanced avionics. 12 million euros isn't cheap for a helicopter of this type. But if this machine can save more priceless lives, it will be worth it. When we have to face strong winds, rough seas, this helicopter really gives you the confidence that you can complete the operation safely and bring the survivors back alive. First, the GPS system means that Salvatore can simply tap in the last known coordinates of his stranded sailors and fly straight there. In fact, he doesn't even have to pilot it. So we just selected the automatic pilot after he's taking us to the search area. When we get there, it starts to follow the search pattern, which you can see here. While the autopilot follows a standard search pattern, the stabilizing systems keep the aircraft steady, on track and at the ideal height, even in gale force winds. Now comes the toughest, most dangerous part of a rescue mission. Especially in bad weather and bad visibility, a chopper is at its most vulnerable in the hover. Another job for the avionics. With the old generation of helicopters, we had to use the collective, the cyclic and the pedals to position the helicopter at 50 feet and zero knots over the survivor. With this helicopter, it's hands off. No pedals, no hands. You don't have to do anything else, just look at the monitor and check that it follows the instructions. It's much safer, because like a fighter plane's avionics, the 139's computer can react much faster than a human pilot to every gust of wind. The rescue team does need to take some control to drop their diver where he's needed. But Salvatore still doesn't get to fly his helicopter himself. Once we get to the survivor, the pilot hands over control of the helicopter to me. With this winch trim, I can control the helicopter to take it exactly above the person in the water. I have a wider view with the door open, so I've got a much better chance of seeing the survivor and putting the helicopter in the right position. These high-cost avionics may be a bit of a luxury on a sunny day in the Mediterranean, but around the world, the 139 has been proving its worth, saving lives in extreme circumstances. In December 2010, Queensland, Australia is hit by a series of devastating flash floods. 70 towns are affected and 200,000 lives are at stake. 139s are used for multiple high-speed rescue missions. The avionics help the pilots handle constantly changing conditions. And the power and size of the 139 gives it plenty of capacity to rescue stranded victims. One helicopter saves 43 people in a single afternoon. Back at Vigiate, new 139 helicopters reach the end of their main assembly line at Station 6. Here, the windscreen and windows are installed. Bodywork covers are added, and the hydraulic system's tested. Then it's time to cross the road to another large hangar, called the flight line, where this completed fuselage will be transformed into a flying machine. But first, it must pass the entrance exam. It's pretty fundamental that a go-anywhere helicopter needs to be weatherproof. So it's not allowed onto the next stage until it passes this test. We're at the water test. At this point, the helicopter is going to take a shower for about 20 minutes to verify if there are any water leaks. Of course, this is no ordinary shower. This rig can deliver 60 litres of water per minute. Simulating a winter storm or a tropical monsoon. Intro 
Inside the cabin, Tommaso and his team are on hand, equipped with torches and mirrors, eager to spot the slightest drip or dribble. And it's not long before they have plenty to fill their notebooks with. As a temporary measure, the team has plenty of tissue paper to plug the leaks in this 12 million euro machine. We found water leaks along the liners, in the tail area, and in the engine mounts. It's a long list, and this one's heading back to the main assembly line. When it's passed the test, admission to the flight line is gained, where the helicopter is fitted with the most fundamental component of all. One that needed a radical redesign to realize the 139's goal of being the fastest helicopter in its class. The rotor blades give helicopters their versatility. Great for flying slow and hovering, they quickly hit problems when they reach high speeds. The 139's blades rotate at a near constant 300 RPM which means in the hover, the tips of the blades are moving at around 800 kilometers per hour. But all that changes when the helicopter's moving forward. The speed of the blades increases on the advancing side of each rotation, because they're traveling the same way as the chopper. As the helicopter gets faster, the speed of the advancing tips starts to approach the sound barrier creating turbulent pressure waves, which quickly get so bad, they unbalance the whole helicopter. Breaking this helicopter speed barrier is a challenge that designer Pierre Abdel Noir has personally taken on. One of the greatest challenges an engineer faces when designing a helicopter is that the advancing blade cannot go much over the sound barrier, as the blade opposite is at a much lower speed. This would create an imbalance on the entire rotor head. Abdel Noir is using supersonic jet design to solve his sound barrier problem. Swept back wings reduce turbulence as a jet goes supersonic. So his 139 blades will have swept back tips. This shape delays the point at which the pressure waves form as the tips approach the speed of sound. So the helicopter can travel faster before serious vibration sets in. In fact, Abdul Noir's design is so good that for once the factor limiting the 139's top speed is not the blades. It's the strength of the windscreen. Abdel Noir also improved the carrying capacity of the blades to match the brute force of the engines by widening the main section. The high carrying capacity of the 139 was made possible thanks to the broad footprint of the blade. He made the blades strong enough to carry 6.8 tons, including the weight of the helicopter and its load which can be up to 15 passengers or two and a half tons of equipment. The main rotor is made up of five blades, each made from composite materials, maximizing strength for low weight. And is held in place by just two titanium bolts. È molto importante che siano installate correttamente. It is important that they're mounted correctly, otherwise there are risks of damaging the blade. And in the worst case, though it's very unlikely, we could lose a blade. And that's not a good thing for a helicopter. <laughs> With the blades fitted, the helicopter, while not complete, is now a working aircraft. And it's time to prepare it for flight. Switching on for the first time is always a tense time. Test engineer Gianluca Frattini needs absolute confidence in his colleagues that have designed and built this complex machine. He carries out all the standard pre-flight checks that any pilot would do before a flight with extra care. Controlliamo che 
We check there are no anomalies, that there is no dust in the air filters, there are no oil or fuel leaks. Then we have a look at the top part of the helicopter. Check there's nothing wrong with the rotor. We check it's all okay. Satisfied that it's all okay, Gianluca tracks down a pilot. But there's a lot more testing and checking to do before this beast flies. This time in close proximity to fast-moving, newly-fitted blades. Even though it's built to microscopic tolerances, this is a high-performance machine that needs tuning, just like a racing car. And this one needs a surprisingly low-tech tweak. The vibrations are over the limit. The rotor's out of balance. The tail blades are color-coded, and Gianluca's instruments indicate it's the red one that needs attention. It's a procedure very similar to balancing the wheel of a car. A length of wire, three 10-gram tungsten beads, and a plastic tube is all you need. Visto che le vibrazioni del rotore di coda sono as the vibration in the tail rotor is over the acceptable limit, I need to put some weights inside the cotter. We'll then run the test again and see if it solves the problem. The adjustments are perfect, the rotor's fixed. We can proceed with other tests now. Problem sorted, and this brand new 139 is approved for flight. The goal of building a go-anywhere, do-anything helicopter has all but been achieved. But to be a success and revive the company's fortunes, one challenge remains. The 139 must sell to a very wide range of customers. So once a helicopter has been flight tested, it goes back to the flight line to be tailored to each customer's needs. Product manager Tommaso Coli is overseeing the customization of 10 different helicopters for his clients. To my right, you can see a helicopter that's destined to be a VIP carrier. The fuselage is instantly recognizable because it has a hinge door instead of a sliding door. In this machine, you can see that we've installed an active anti-vibrator. There are three boxes. Basically, there are blocks that are moved electronically to cancel out the natural vibration of the helicopter. This is a system that's unique to the 139, and it's much appreciated by our VIP clients. This transmission is designed just for the VIP version. It has a system that reduces noise and vibration to give a more comfortable flight than the other models. With many customization features now in place, the helicopter is effectively complete. So it's time to take it apart again for painting. The painting period is a long one and very complex because the machine gets here and firstly gets painted with a special primer that protects the helicopter. After that, more coats are applied, depending on the design and color that the client has chosen. Back on the flight line, the painted fuselage is reassembled and the final level of customization takes place. Mountain rescue helicopters get their skis, police choppers get cameras, and VIPs get their luxury interiors.
This particular machine is destined for a cold country, so it's been given a very special added extra. The 139 is the only machine of its kind that has a de-icing system. This system is made up of generators that produce electricity, which is sent to the blades, in order to warm them up. The system is triggered automatically by sensors that check the speed of the ice formation, or the pilot can activate it manually by looking at the amount of ice building up on this ball. At the far end of the flight line is a room reserved for handshakes and champagne. This is where completed helicopters are handed over to their new owners. Today it's the turn of an offshore machine and the clients have come a long way to pick up the keys. My whole team here flew all the way from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia to collect the, uh, the last helicopter. Today is the crowning glory of the whole building process. So it's a very emotional moment that involves a number of people, and especially the top management and obviously the client. It was a hundred million euro gamble and an extraordinary engineering challenge, but it's paying off. So the 139 is a game changer. It's a game changer for us because it has propelled us uh, from being a niche player into being a major player in the civil market. It has propelled the company into the Champions League uh, of a uh, helicopter manufacturer. The AW139 has already sold 500 units around the world. It's saving lives, crossing oceans, braving blizzards. In fact, it's doing pretty much anything you could dream of a helicopter doing. And plenty more besides.